Hi, I'm Sid, and I'm a web ecosystem consultant for the Privacy Sandbox. In this video, I will be showing a detailed example of how ad serving would work with the protected audience API, one of the technologies of the Privacy Sandbox. If you haven't seen our other video providing the foundations of how protected audience API works, definitely check that out first. We'll be following along with the same example, but we'll add a few more details. We'll have a smartphone manufacturer running a campaign for the newest smartphone. They are targeting an in-market audience for smartphones, and they'll have a few requirements. First, they're only targeting US consumers. Next, they only want to target consumers within three days of the intent signal. And finally, they want fewer than three impressions per user per day. And we'll simplify the setup a little bit. There will only be one supply-side platform, or SSP, monetizing the publisher's inventory, working with multiple demand-side platforms, or DSPs. And we won't get into the normal programmatic RTB auction and how it fits with the protected audience API, which is focused on the protected audience auction. At the end, we'll point to other content that covers that. What we'll do is go through the journey end-to-end, step-by-step. And this will be done in five steps. First, we'll create audiences. Then, we'll set up the auction. Next, run the auction and show how the data and the decisions flow through. Finally, we'll have the ad render, and everyone will receive the reporting they need. Now, these steps may look familiar to how things work today, but as we showed in the high level, audiences are held on device, the auction is kicked off on device, with the auction then running on device or in trusted execution environments. Then the final ad coming from the auction is encrypted, and the reporting comes with the browser. Lots of differences, so let's dive in. Across the top, you'll see the progress bar of where we are in the journey. We're going to start with building audiences. We're back on the product review side, and again, this is giving the signal for this user being in market for a smartphone. You create the audience directly on the browser and do so with the join ad interest group JavaScript call. When that's called, that secure environment we discussed is registered with some information. First, the name of the audience. In this case, it's smartphones, since the user is in market for smartphones. The owner or the creator of the audience shows who can bid on this audience. Next, we have data about that specific campaign the campaign ID, and a link to the creator for this campaign. Then we have some data that can be used while bidding on this audience. Here, the target geography for the campaign and also the time of last intent signal for the user. That could be the last time this ad tech saw the user on the product review site. Finally, there are links to resources hosted on the DSP's servers. Now, this is pretty unique. So let's take a closer look at these things hosted on the DSP servers. Broadly, the DSP is hosting two resources on its server a data store maintaining the campaign's status, and a JavaScript implementing the bidding logic, which is fetched by the browser and executed in a secure auction environment. First, let's look at this campaign data store. This has that lock symbol because eventually, this will be required to be in a special kind of server, one that is hosted in a trusted execution environment. However, to ease initial adoption, protected audience enables ad techs to use their own servers in their own environments. For the latest on timelines for specific protected audience features and capabilities, visit the short link on the screen. This is purely a key value store that tracks by campaign ID if the campaign is still running. If there is budget and it's active, it can be classified as live. If not, paused. This data is completely maintained by the DSP and made available to the auction and bidding logic later. Speaking of bidding logic, what is that exactly? This is the gendered bid function. This is logic determining how much a DSP is willing to bid for a particular interest group. Let's create an example logic. The DSP could begin by checking if the campaign is still live for a given campaign ID. If it is paused, then no bid. If live, then they proceed with other considerations. The campaign is scoped only to users based in the US. So if it's not a US user, no bid. If the user is in the US, they check for the number of impressions. The advertiser wants them to limit this to three impressions within a 24-hour window. So if you've already had three, then no bid. If the number of impressions is less than three, then they consider the recency of purchase intent. This campaign is targeting users with intent signal within three days. And the advertiser is willing to bid higher for a more recent signal. So they bid $3 if the observed intent signal is within the last day, $2 if it's within one to two days, and a dollar for the two to three day range. And they don't bid if it's any higher. Now, all of that bidding logic is written in JavaScript and executed by the browser. But fundamentally, it's just representing the bidding logic I just walked through. So I just walked through the creation of one audience on the product review side. Now, as their browser goes around the web, their activity may provide other signals for their interests. 
Perhaps they go to a tech forum and that's a signal that they're a tech enthusiast. Or they're looking at specific product pages like a specific smartphone or a smart home device. And those companies may be interested to re-engage with them. Or maybe they purchase a laptop online and that's a signal for their interest. Any of these activities would help advertisers create more relevant experiences and protected audience would support creating interest groups to enable just that. That's why we talk about this being a custom audiences platform. The web advertising ecosystem can create any audience based on the activities directly observed online. Then these audiences are all secure in the on-device environment. Then when the user browses to the news site, these audiences come with them. At the top, we move to the second step in the journey, configuring the auction. Now, the user is on the news side. This is where an ad will be shown. And the browser is still maintaining audience memberships via the interest groups. Interest groups are encrypted and not observable by any other party. Similar to the audience creation, the publisher or the ad tech partner they work with create the auction directly on the browser and do so with the run ad auction JavaScript call. You would call that with the auction configuration, which registered some information about the auction with the browser. First, there's the seller running the auction. In this example, ssp.example. Then there's the buyers the SSP is inviting into this auction, which includes dsp.example and others. Collectively, they created those five audiences. The SSP could also set a timeout, in this case, 100 milliseconds. This will cap how long the DSP has to bid per audience. We'll see all these come into play when the auction runs. But let's introduce some other data for the auction parameters. Let's say this new site does not want any advertisements for e-readers. They can do that by including these in the restrictions in the auction configurations. They can also capture other metadata you may be familiar with in programmatic auctions, such as impression time and geography. In this case, the impression time is incorporated in the auction and the browser is currently in the United States. All of this data will be eventually be made available for bidding and ad scoring logic during the auction. Finally, similar to the DSP, the SSP will also point the browser to two resources hosted on the servers. One represented as a decision URL is the ad scoring logic written in JavaScript. The other represented as ad metadata URL is hosting additional details about the DSP's creatives. Again, this is worth zooming in a bit to understand what's happening here. Okay, so there's a connection being created between the browser and the SSP servers. First, there's a data store for ad meta tags. Similar to the DSP, this has that lock symbol because eventually this will be required to be in a special kind of server. Again, see the short link for the latest on timelines. Then there's the server that's hosting the scoring logic. Now, this server is merely hosting the logic. The browser will fetch that logic and then execute it in the secure auction environment. Now, in the ads metadata store, this is simply a key value store. It's common for SSPs to scan creators before allowing them to render. They review for malware and also categorize based on content, things like product category and brand. In this case, this SSP has done just that. To keep it simple, you see two columns. First, the specific creative's URL. Second, some data about that creative. On the first row, you can see the creative for the smartphones campaign and has been categorized as a phone ad for the phone co-brand. We'll see how this comes into play during the auction in the next step. Then there's the scoring logic. This is the score ad function. Just like the DSP, this will incorporate the decision for how to score and rank ad creatives. We'll keep this simple. The SSP will check if the creative is on the block list for that publisher. If it is not on the block list, the SSP will provide a score that is equal to the bid. If it is on the block list, the SSP will score the ad at zero, regardless of the bid amount. Similar to the DSP's bidding logic, the scoring logic will also be written in JavaScript and executed by the browser. But fundamentally, it's a representation of the logic we just showcased. So if you've seen the first two steps, the audience creation and initiating the auction. We'll see how this all comes together in the third step, the secure auction. In this case, happening on device. We're going to see this play out in two steps. First, the DSP's bidding, then the SSP's ad scoring. This box represents what's happening in the secure auction environment in this case, on the device. We'll start with bidding. The bid is determined by two things, the data available to bidding and the bidding logic. Now, we've already seen both of these, but we will see how they come together now. 
Let's start first with the data available for bidding. First, there was the data that was brought by the buyer themselves. This included the campaign associated with this audience. That was phone US one. Then the geo they were targeting, which is United States. And the time they last observed the intent signal. Then the browser is going to use this campaign ID, phone US one, and call the buyer's campaign status server. This was that server we took a deeper look into earlier. Then from that server, pull back if the campaign is still live, which it is. This happens in real time at the time of the auction. Then there's data the seller brought into the auction. This was the specific impression time. Then the geo for this browser at the time of the impression, which is the United States. Finally, the browser itself also brings data into the auction. In this case, it includes the previous time this browser had rendered this exact ad. As you can see, at this particular moment, this campaign's ad has been delivered to the browser two times. Now, the browser fetches the bidding logic from the buyer's bidding logic server. This is the generate bid function. It brings it into the secure auction environment, and all the data we just went through gets applied to the bidding logic to determine a bid. So let's go through the logic step by step. First, it checks if the campaign is live. Yep, based on the data pulled in real time, this campaign is live. Good to go there. Then it checks if this is a United States user. Well, the seller included the geo for this auction as United States. That equals to the target campaign geo brought in by the buyer. So yes, this is a US user. Then recall that, that there was a frequency cap to ensure no more than three impressions per 24 hours. Well, the browser data includes the prior times this browser saw this ad, which we see is currently two times. Two is less than three, so yep, we're good to go to continue bidding. Finally, there's the days since last intent. As you recall from the bidding logic, there was a pricing waterfall. The more recent the intent, the higher the bid. In this case, based on the last intent signal and the current impression time, we are within 24 hours. So the buyer will bid the maximum amount of $3. So now we have a bid, and this feeds into the ad scoring, which we'll look at now. Let's run through the ad scoring logic. Again, there's the data available for scoring on the left side and the scoring logic on the right. Let's again first go through the data. First, the seller included the creator restrictions, which for the new side is a block on e-readers. Next, the buyer has bid, so we have details of that bid. We know that the DSP that bid, DSP.example, and their bid amount of three. We also have the URL of the creator for this interest group, shown here. If you recall, the seller has a server where they've hosted metadata about that creator. This comes from that creative scanning service. Now, at this point, the browser will fetch the creative metadata from the seller's server using the creative URL as a lookup key. So now available for the ad scoring is the seller's creative metadata from their own scanning service. Similar to the DSP's budgets, this data is fetched again in real time at the time of the auction. Now, the browser fetches the ad scoring logic from the seller's decision logic server. Just like the buyer, it brings this logic alongside all the data we just walked through in the secure auction environment. This is the score ad function. So let's determine the ad score. If you recall, we had a simple logic. The logic will simply check if the creative is on the block list. Well, based on the seller's creative scanning service, this is an ad for a phone for the brand Phone Co. And that's not an issue. No e-reader here. So the seller's logic will apply a score equal to the bid, which was three. So the score is three. And that's that. We've seen a buyer bid three, a seller scored three, and all the data that they brought into the auction, plus a little data from the browser. So now we've seen this on a step-by-step -step level for a single interest group. So let's go through this end-to-end -end for all the interest groups. Independently, they'll each go through the same steps. The interest groups will bid, then their ads are scored. On the left side, you will see these interest groups. In the center, you'll see the bid generation by the buyer. On the right side, you'll see the seller scoring each ad. And if you recall, there were a total of five interest groups on this browser. So let's go through their bidding. We saw the bid for the first one, the smartphones interest group, for three. So let's say the other two bid one and two respectively. Additionally, when the seller configured the auction, they put a timeout constraint of 100 milliseconds for bids. So let's say these three bids took eight, five, and one milliseconds respectively. Those are all under 100 milliseconds. So great, no problem there. But if, say, the last two interest group could took 120 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds, respectively, then they time out and they don't get a chance to bid. 
So we have three valid bits available for scoring. Let's go through that final step. If you recall, the scoring logic is only checking if any of these ad creatives are e-readers, which are blocked. Let's say the tech enthusiast interest group is exactly that, an ad for an e-reader. In that case, the scoring logic provides a score of zero and it's blocked from rendering. The other two interest groups, smartphones and viewed phone, are not for e-readers, so they get scored equal to their bid, three and two respectively. The highest scoring ad wins, which is three for the smartphones interest group. And voila, an ad for the smartphone is rendered on the publisher side. So ad, ad is now on the screen, and the last step is everyone getting the reporting that they need. Let's take a look at that. Once the ad renders, the browser will send reports to the buyer and the seller that won the auction. We call these event-level reports as they will be sent after each auction event. There's also aggregate reporting, which is not sent on an event level, but rather summarized over many, many auctions. For the latest on timelines for availability event-level reporting, again, see the short link on the screen. So for the event-level reports, both the seller and the buyer will stand up their own service to receive these reports on the browser. Let's take a look at the information it would include. For the seller, they will be notified, hey, an auction completed and the ad was rendered. It would include information like the winning ad, the winning bid, their score for that bid, and the publisher it occurred on, the buyer who won the auction and the specific URL of the winning creative. Now, it can include other data, like any contextual information the seller brought into the auction, but this gives an example of some of the core pieces of information. For the buyer, they will be notified, hey, you won an auction and your ad was rendered. It would include information like their bid, the publisher it occurred on, the seller who ran the auction, and note that it will differ a bit from the sell side. The buyer won't know the score of the ad, but they will know the specific name of the interest group that won. The seller wouldn't see that. With this information, the buyer and seller could do something critical. Make sure the right amount of money changes hands. So we have just showed the post-auction reporting. What about post-render user engagement? This can be captured too. So the ad gets rendered and you get reporting on that, but you can also capture when the ad is viewed, even using any custom viewability requirements you might have. And you can also capture when the ad is clicked. At this point, the user navigates away from the publisher site, but attribution requires looking at post-ad engagement metrics. Using the attribution reporting API, that's also possible. So the user navigates to the advertiser's site from the ad creative, which is the smartphone manufacturer's site showcasing the smartphone. Here, you can capture an engagement funnel. Say, the user landed on the homepage, they added the product to the cart, and then they purchased. These events would be observed in a privacy-preserving way and made available to further optimize the campaign strategy. And that, in a nutshell, is protected audience end-to-end. -end. And that last visual of the post-render event funnel also incorporated other APIs like the Fence Frames Ads Reporting and Attribution Reporting API. Now, we were just deep in the weeds seeing how this works step-by-step. Step. But taking a step back, what were some of the core capabilities we highlighted? First, for advertisers, they were able to implement budgeting and pacing. As you recall, the bidding logic check if the campaign was live before bidding. Contextual targeting. In this example, a core input was recency, time since the last intent signal, and also frequency capping. The advertiser was able to cap the number of impression at less than three per 24 hours. On the publisher side, they were able to validate creators against their restrictions and requirements. Second, the behavioral-based advertisement was enabled via this secure environment on the browser. That prevents sensitive user data, including the publisher first-party data, from being shared outside the secure environment to enable this ad. And for both advertiser and the publisher, they were able to leverage their respective first-party data and both receive reporting. This example simplified some aspects of the API design. And we would provide a mapping table so you can map this back to the public explainer. This table highlights the mapping for the audience creation and bidding aspects. You can pause the video to take, take a moment to review. And this table highlights the mapping for the auction configuration and ad scoring aspects. Again, feel free to pause the video and review. So where should you go from here? To learn more, we'll provide some links to other resources. We have recordings for past webinars that go even deeper. And if you're interested in technical details like sequence diagram, check those out.
Then there's a the documentation on developer.chrome.com. We're continually adding more content, so it's that definitely a great resource. And finally, you can go right to the source of truth and check out the explainer. It's a more technical doc, but it describes the API design in all the detail. All of these links are provided in the description below. What if you're interested in starting experimenting with this in the real world? Well, if you're a publisher, we would recommend two things. First, if you're using header bidding platforms, connect with them to identify if they integrate with the protected audience API. Ask for the docs on how to enable it. Second, connect with your ad tech partners, including supply side platforms, and ask if there are tests you can participate in. Check out the public tester list of who's testing, and many have put an email to reach out to. And for you ad techs, all of the above is relevant. But you can also start tinkering with the code. Check out our demo code and accompanying video in the description below. You can see the source code and observe what's happening directly within Chrome DevTools. And that's about it. Any feedback on this or anything on the private sandbox, please send it to the link below. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.